Thanks, Shafi, uh, and thank you for coming, uh, given the uh, weather outside. Uh, so, uh, so some of you, uh, the part of this uh, talk will be uh, quite old hat, but uh, I hope there'll be interesting things uh, for everybody in the talk. So I'm going to talk about the limits to proof. And uh, when we start, we start with formal proofs. And there really are two people at the late 19th century, early 20th century, who are really um, almost synonymous with the introduction of, of formal proof. One was a superstar in mathematics, and the other is largely unknown, or very little known. Uh, the little known one is uh, Gottlob Frege. And what I didn't realize before I was doing this talk is that in fact, his, in 1884, one of his uh, papers had actually really introduced uh, the notion of formally quantified variables and the quantifiers that we use now. Uh, then later in the 1890s, he spent a huge amount of work on a monumental, uh, uh, what was intended to be two volume, uh, 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 a tome on the basic laws of, of arithmetic and how to develop everything from logical principles. Um, the other, of course, is David Hilbert, who started, a, had already had a, a great career doing other aspects of mathematics, but starting in right at the, the turn of the 20th century, started to focus on questions about uh, formal proof and, and formalizing mathematics. And his foundations of geometry in 1899 was at a level of formalism that even Euclid never had. And in his uh, famous address at the Math Congress in 1900, where he set out his 23 problems, he very clearly uh, uh, focused on the question of how to do things with formal procedures uh, to solve all sorts of problems. And his program, which he uh, proselytized a, a, a lot, especially in the 1920s, was really the pro program of mechanizing formal proof. And he's famous for the statement, there's no ignoramibus, we don't know in mathematics. So he's definitely uh, was, uh, like both of the, them were uh, optimists about uh, formal proofs. Um, Frege, unfortunately, got a little pessimistic when Bertrand Russell came along in 1901 and pointed out, you know this concept of the, your system, you can talk about the set of all sets? Well, there's an unfortunate uh, paradox in that. And he, together with his advisor, Alfred North Whitehead, uh, decided it worked the next 10 years trying to formalize all of mathematics. And you might be familiar with uh, this volume, which is just volume one, or not all of volume one, of the Principia Mathematica, this volume uh, being the only part on page 360, just a short distance from the end, proves one plus one equals two. So that's, uh, you know, a lot of people sort of think, well, that was the end, that's all they got to, but they actually got to two more volumes uh, uh, of similar size and then uh, gave up. Now they formalized a lot and introduced things like type theory, but they, um, really didn't get all that far in uh, formalizing um, uh, mathematics proper. And there was a reason for that. Uh, and that uh, is the first limits to proof. And this Gödel in his famous uh, 1931 paper showed that their project would be impossible if you wanted to express all the basic arithmetic properties of the natural numbers. Any formal system you could come up with that's consistent would have statements that can neither be proved or disproved. Turing came along and inspired by Gödel and ex extending these ideas showed uh, that the halting problem is undecidable, in particular that there's no algorithm to determine whether or not other arbitrary algorithms halt. And this Entscheidung's problem is actually one of Hilbert's uh, uh, problems that was the inspiration for his work. Of course, this doesn't mention proof, so we just tweak it. There's no system of proof that can prove whether or not arbitrary algorithms halt. So proofs, very limited. Well, there is an infinity in these limits to proof. So Gödel in completeness, we've got all of the natural numbers. And Turing's undecidability of the halting problem, not halting means running forever, arbitrarily large time bounds. 
So there's no impossibility result for either if, say, numbers larger than 10 to the 10 and the 10 or running times that big uh, come into play. And well, we live in a finite universe with finite lifetime. So what's the f how can we think about the finiteness? Well, quantum theory tells us Planck length is kind of the smallest uni unit of information. Actually, if you take a Planck length cube, it's got six sides and you can store about at most one bit uh, per side, which is about six. And if you take the size of our universe and do it all out, the number of cubic Planck lengths is really not that big. And the actual, the time of a universe is really uh, very small, if we, even if we measured in nanoseconds of the form of computers we do now. And so by, you know, just to compare these, we've got two to the 50th, which is sort of comparable there. And even a year of computer time is really not that far in the exponent from the total life of the universe. So, you know, maybe, maybe these infinite things aren't really a problem. And the first places where, uh, where this uh, came up was, was in the notion of computing. We're computing in a finite world. So we're making, when people first did physical realizations of digital uh, computers, they realized that efficiency was important. In fact, von Neumann was famous for, well known for going around, not famous for it, um, and saying, well, we have to make sure that these algorithms run quickly. Why was it? Well, the computers would actually break down before the computation finished uh, with the early computers. So that was the reason he was interested. We're a little bit more reliable now. But it was very uh, quickly realized that there were good algorithms, algorithms that were bounded by um, uh, num quantities that are polynomial functions of the input size and bad input algorithms that are exponential. And in the 60s, people realized that many problems have often surprisingly good algorithms, but others only seem to have bad ones. And this motivated the definition of polynomial time, which probably is effectively due to Cobham. So it runs in polynomial time if its number of steps is, grows as n to the order one. And for simplicity, we focus on decision problems, where the answer is just true, false, or yes, no, and define P to be the set of all decision problems with polynomial time algorithms. So that's the, uh, uh, the notion of computation in a finite world. What about reasoning in a finite world? So without loss of generality, we can represent any finite world or, and the states, the actions, whatever you want by finite sequences of bits. I really don't want this going off to infinity. Um, and there we can get to a much simpler logic uh, than uh, Frege or Hilbert were talking about, which is propositional logic and going back to George Boole. So we've got Boolean variables and connectives and or not and implies. So what are the things we might want to understand about this logic? Well, we want to, the properties of Boolean formulas, these formulas express constraints that our world has to satisfy and the worlds are possible assignments of true false values to these Boolean variables. So we've got properties like satisfiability. A formula is satisfiable or true if in some worlds, tautology, it's always true and unsatisfiable if it's always false in all possible words. So here's a simple one and it's nice you can go back and forth between tautology and unsatisfiability just by sticking knots in front. Okay, so the first of these uh, problems that could tackled is the problem of satisfiability. You know, this audience, uh, probably, uh, probably uh, uh, we're going to be you know, a little bored for the next couple minutes, but uh, so if it has Boolean variables, we can try all assignments. Um, so the question is, is this problem of deciding whether a formula is satisfiable, is it polynomial time? Of course, it's open, but there is this related problem where we have a polynomial time algorithm, which is given a Boolean formula, and a truth assignment to it, does that truth assignment make the formula true? So there, we do have some polynomial time task, and a formula is sat, if and only if there exists some t that makes it true, which means there exists some t, such that it's a verification algorithm that's checking uh, whether uh, t sat, uh, makes it true, uh, says yes. So t is a proof that f is sat, and the other piece about it is it's also very short. In fact, it's linear in the size of, of the input. So, of course, Cook and Levin famously uh, generalized this notion of 
having something that's easy to check, like checking that a satisfying assignment, uh, assignment satisfies a formula or makes it true with non-deterministic polynomial time. So we can write it. I'm going to write it in a formal way. Uh, so these are decision problems that have a polynomial time associated verification algorithm such that a string x is a yes for the decision problem if and only if there's a short proof y such that this verifier checks out and says y does prove that x is, is, uh, is, is a yes for that problem. And by short, we mean polynomial. So, of course, sat is NP complete. That's the big result of both Cook and, and Levin on opposite sides of the Iron Curtain, which means that if sat is NP, then P equals NP, and figure that out, and the Clay Institute will give you some, uh, some uh, bills of that form. So, uh, <laughs> million dollars. Uh, so, Boolean formulas, so these are the same problems we, we had before. So, um, we, we know, uh, uh, really have a, a decent understanding of satisfiability, uh, obviously big open questions about it, but what about tautology or unsatisfiability? So, for this, we need to think about what constitutes a proof of tautology or satisfiability. Well, here's the conventional textbook proofs. So we've got some axioms like excluded middle, inference rules like modus ponens, and a proof is a sequence of lines, each of which follows either from an axiom or from an inference rule, and the last thing you've got is the thing you're proving. So, but another thing that's also a proof would be truth tables. These are also proofs. They're very easy to check locally. You can just check how each uh, more complicated formula depends on the previous simpler ones, and then you just uh, check the final line. So that is a proof as well. And Cook and Recco uh, realized that there's something more general going on here. We need a system for expressing proofs, such that proofs are easy to check. And that's the key property of both the truth tables and these, these inference systems. So we think about it as this polynomial time verification algorithm that's going to check the proof, taking a formula and its supposed proof that's sound, it outputs true. If it does, then you've got something that say a tautology or unsatisfiability uh, or unsatisfiable. And it's complete. For every tautology, there is a proof such that the verifier likes it. The verifier checks it out. So this is very much like the definition of NP. But there's one critical difference. There's no requirement that this proof P be short. Okay? So that's the sole difference from the definition of NP. This easy to check, this having this sufficient verifier is, is the key piece. So, um, so the, the, once we have this, we need a notion of complexity. Truth tables aren't as good as uh, as these other inference systems for writing down proofs. So the complexity of a proof system will exactly capture this question of, well, how big does the proof actually have to be? So C of F, it's a, it's a, it's a numerical bound or a numerical function that tells you, given how big your formula is, how big the proof has to be. So truth tables have complexity at least two to the n. You just need two to the n rows to write them down if they're um, n variables in your formula. Now, C of n, so if we could show, find a system where C of n is polynomial in n, then we'd have a proof of tautology or unsatisfiability being an NP, because this would be that one extra missing condition about the shortness of proof. On the other hand, if we can show that it's impossible for all proof systems for unsatisfiability, it's impossible for this to be polynomial in N for all proofs of unsatisfiability, then we would conclude that P is not equal NP. And here's the quick idea. Well, unsatisfiability is the complement of SAT, so we'd say that that's not in NP. But if we're in P, so the complement of any problem in P is also in P, and since SAT is in NP, its complement, if it were also in P, its complement better be, so SAT is not in NP. So, all right, so this question of how big proofs are is really the fundamental question of, of proof complexity, and it's a very interesting question from the point of view 
of, uh, of what it's trying to say because proof complexity just doesn't, doesn't just bound what deterministic algorithms can do, how long they'll take, it bounds non-deterministic algorithms as well. So it only measures how big proofs have to be, how many symbols it takes to write them down. It doesn't say anything about how complicated it is to find them. And in general, the, uh, the search problem, finding a proof might be, as, uh, might, uh, be require some form of exhaustive search. So finding the proofs might be much harder than just uh, writing them down. Um, however, you might think, well, proof systems, we came up with a couple. Um, there are actually many, many proof systems one can come up with. Any deterministic algorithm for SAT with a running time T of n yields a proof system for unsatisfiability with complexity roughly like T of n. And the basic idea is if you've got some unsatisfiable formula you want to prove it's unsatisfiable, just run the algorithm and write down the transcript of all the states you've been through and that is a proof that no satisfying assignment exists if you had a deterministic algorithm for SAT. So that's one way we can come up with them. And this method actually uh, does relate to some things in practice, as we'll see. Um, the proof complexity program, if they could uh, uh, say that, is uh, to prove that uh, specific systems of increasing strength are not polynom polynomially bounded. So, um, so one of the way reasons why you might want to do this is as steps towards proving p not equal np. It would actually prove something stronger, potentially, that np is different from co-np. I won't uh, go through the definitions. Um, but the other thing is that understanding these proof systems may also be uh, relevant and useful in, in practice. OK. So, um, but how do we compare strength of proof systems? So Cook and Reco said, well, if one proof system simulates another, if proofs in one can be efficiently converted to proofs in the other. So it tells you that proofs in that one can be at most polynomially than proofs in the original system. And proof systems are equivalent if and only if they simulate each other. And one of the first systems that, uh, class of systems that Cook and uh, were analyzed by Cook and Reco, which they called Frege systems, um, and are largely uh, known elsewhere before this as Hilbert systems, even though Frege had essentially defined them uh, much earlier, but Hilbert was a big popularism, a popularizer of them. So these are inference systems that are given just like the ones we've seen, a finite set of axioms and inference rules. And the axioms and inference rules are actually used as schemas where you get to substitute consistently into uh, of the formula. So for example, given this axiom A or not A, we can plug in X and Y and say we can automatically conclude that this line is true. Um, now, a Frege system is any such inference system that is general enough to make all possible inferences after some number of steps. It might take you uh, a while. And what Cook and Reco proved is that all of these Frege systems, no matter how you uh, define them, are all equivalent with, to each other. They can be, uh, the proofs from one can be converted to proofs from the other, and it's actually uh, not too difficult to prove. Now, uh, Frege systems and uh, proof systems in general um, deal with arbitrary Boolean formulas as input. And it'd be nice to have something uh, a simpler version of input to deal with. And here's a, a nice form that's very convenient for uh, as input to uh, these uh, proof systems. So a Boolean formula is the CNF, stands for conjunctive normal form, if it's of the following form. We've got a bunch of, it's an and of a bunch of clauses, uh, each of which is an or of a bunch of literals, each of which is a variable or its negation. So this is a nice, flat, simple, uh, type representation that happens to be very good on, uh, to represent on computers um, and to work with. And Seiton in 68 showed that there's a linear time transformation that will convert any Boolean formula F into a CNF formula that has the same satisfiability properties. 
So we might as well just work with that CNF formula. So we can assume without loss of generality that our input is a CNF formula because we could just quickly do a conversion of the sort that he uh, suggested. And this is, of course, part of uh, the standard proof that 3SAT is NP complete. And just uh, for completeness, I'll uh, describe the construction. So in general, it works for arbitrary Boolean circuits. And these are graphs which have variables as their input and these connectives as gates. And the main difference from Boolean formulas is that in Boolean formulas, there will only be one output edge from, uh, from each gate, whereas here you might have uh, multiple inputs. And of course, and these can in fact uh, efficiently simulate any polytime computation. And the Seiden transformation is, uh, is nice. You actually add some extra variables, one for each of the gates. Okay, that's going to express the value of the gate. And then we add clauses. One, an and of clauses, one clause to say that each internal gate is computed correctly, and a plus a clause saying that the output uh, gate is true. Okay, so we've got CNF uh, formulas inputs or dealing with clauses. Why not do a proof system that just deals with clauses? And that's resolution proofs. Um, this is a refutation system for CNF input. Every proof line is a clause. Each line is either a clause of the input or follows from two, it's got one inference rule, one inference rule only. If we take two clauses and they have variables of opposite signs, then the or of the remaining variables has to be true because no assignment can make both the, uh, both of two X can make both of these true. And the goal is to derive the empty clause, which can't be made true because there are no variables in it to make it true. This is sound and complete for, for clauses and it's incredibly useful in practice. So um, resolution uh, has a strong connection to formal methods in CS. And if uh, since of, I would say about 2000, formal methods for analyzing software and hardware using SAT solvers has just really revolutionized uh, the field of, of, uh, of analysis for, for computing. And the general idea is you write a CNF formula expressing the constraints that any bug has to satisfy. So any satisfying assignment is a bug. So the correctness of a system is equivalent to showing that the CNF formula is unsatisfiable. And the fact that we can do write these even for circuits is, is extremely convenient. Um, now, modern SAT solvers are what are called conflict-directed clause learning, or CDCL extensions of DPLL algorithms. Um, and they're extremely successful. CDCL solvers, I mean, they work well on CNF formulas with tens to hundreds of thousands of variables, millions of clauses, even that we know that SAT is NP complete. Um, that doesn't actually mean that they always work. And there are actually a number of ways that uh, people were initially were uh, trying to solve problems using these uh, solvers, and they ran into some problems that actually turned out to have been uh, previously, uh, oh, sorry, let me back up. Um, uh, so let me explain a little bit about these solvers, uh, CDCL and, and DPLL. So DPLL comes from the name of two papers by Davis, Putnam, uh, Logeman, and Loveland. The first doesn't have anything to do with the DPLL algorithm, but showed how you could translate first order logic into refutation search for CNF formulas. The later paper is what introduced the backtracking search for satisfying assignments that really, uh, and plug it into the approach of the first paper that really is the, the basis of, of the modern algorithms. But just to keep various people happy, the, the P is kept in the, the middle. Um, so, the th it's not hard to show, it's a, I, I couldn't even think of what a, a reference is, it's like folklore, is that if you've got an unset formula and run DPLL search on it and it fails, that trace thing becomes a resolution refutation of the original formula, but of a special form. When you derive a clause, you don't get to reuse it. So you derive a clause and you want to use it again, you have to derive it again. So that's a very restricted form of resolution proof. Um, CDCL solvers, these are extensions beginning late 90s, 2000s, which primarily the new thing was adding new learned clauses to the formula at every backtrack. 
and there are also things like restarts and a lot of other tricks. But uh, you can also show that resolution uh, uh, covers, uh, you know, the traces of these things when they fail to find uh, a satisfying assignment are actually resolution refutations of the formulas. So resolution really does capture what these uh, SAT solvers are doing. And as I was uh, mentioning earlier, the, uh, there are limits to resolution. So one of the limits is the famous pigeonhole principle. So these four pigeons want to go to these uh, pigeonholes for the night. And the problem is that two of them, you know, at least two of them are going to be unhappy because they land in the same pigeonhole. Um, so how do we express this in uh, Boolean uh, logic? Well, we have a variable for each of these possible edges. Xij says that pigeon i maps to whole j. We have clauses that, um, that say, so this says every pigeon is mapped somewhere. This says it's only mapped to one place. And this says every hole gets at most, these say every hole gets at most one pigeon. And this is unsatisfiable by the pigeonhole principle. Um, well, Hawkins showed in 1984 that every resolution refutation of the pigeonhole principle requires exponential size. Now, remember exponential, n doesn't have to be too big before this is larger than the number of uh, symbols you can represent in the universe. Um, and uh, so resolution can't count. Um, and then later, Resborov actually showed that doesn't matter how many extra uh, pigeons you have, you resolution still can't figure out. And in practice, this really is an issue. SAT solvers can't refute the pigeonhole principle when it's like roughly 20 variables or maybe a little bit more than that. So even though they can handle thousands of variables, this is only a few hundred variables and they get stuck. Um, another class of formulas where uh, these solvers uh, have major problems are random formulas. So take a random KCNF formula for k bigger, bigger than or equal to 3. So that by KCNF, that means the clauses are size k. And if we choose some linear number with a sufficiently large constant in the linear number, it's unsatisfiable almost surely. But almost surely, every resolution refutation requires exponential size. So there are loads of other problems uh, that one can choose uh, show resolution is bad at. One of the uh, there's a general technique due to Bensasson and Wigderson that if you can show that there even has to be one large clause, one clause of big size, then the whole proof is huge, uh, provided the input doesn't have uh, clauses that are too big. But um, we'll think resolution and, and random formulas we'll kind of uh, think of as a little carrying examples, but they're just representative of many other examples that are known to be hard for resolution. OK, so what about formulas of larger depth than CNF? Well, CNF input was no loss, but it seems potentially that you requiring that in the proof is a loss. What happens if we uh, allow a little bit more? So CNFs are big ands of big ors. What happens if we have big ands of big ors of big ands of big ors d levels deep? Then we get AC0 formulas of depth d. And no, they, they can't do the pigeonhole principle either. It's still exponential for them to prove the, the pigeonhole principle. Now, it is true that Frege proofs can actually prove the pigeonhole principle in polynomial size. Um, we'll, we'll see in a minute why um, I'm not going to talk uh, too much about uh, Frege proofs. But um, one thing that's still open for these uh, bounded depth proofs is whether random formulas uh, have even uh, have efficient proofs. It's still open that random formulas, these random KCNF formulas, might be hard. So these are systems that are more specialized in Frege. What happens if we go in the other direction to get more general than Frege? So in Frege systems, the only variables that you're allowed to use are the original variables. You can't define new ones. And the only schemas you get to use are the axioms and the inference rules. But suppose you've proved an axiom. Why not allow yourself to substitute in that axiom right away? Uh, pro pro suppose you've proved a tautology. Why not allow yourself to substitute into that, too? Uh, well, if you allow either of do these two things, substitution of arbitrary formulas or extension, where you allow extra variables, even if you've started with just with resolution, uh, 
Then it turns out you get a system called extended Frege, and Cook and Reckow actually proved that all extended Frege things are equivalent, proofs in which lines are basically Boolean circuits and not just formulas. Uh, and in fact, this extension of resolution is kind of a natural direction that people have tried to do with practical SAT solvers. Uh, it's fairly limited in how well it, it, it works so far because the trying to figure out how to define new variables is really hard uh, for the search. But we don't have to stop here. We can even define proof systems with quantified proof lines. Hey, why not do Z the zermelo frankel set theory with the axiom of choice? That could be a proof system. So if we take uh, in these directions, uh, here are some proof system relationship we know. So truth tables, DPLL, resolution AC0 Frege, and ZFC. And there's no reason to see it, say that it stops here. We don't believe that there's actually any stopping. There might be an infinite family of more and more powerful proof systems. There's one I haven't mentioned here, but um, this is TC0 Frege. It's a different weakening of a uh, Frege proof. Each line here consists of a constant depth neural net, basically. They can count, so they can do pigeonhole principle. And the reason why I didn't say anything more about these is we have no idea about lower bounds for any of these systems up here. So we're going to focus on systems where we can actually do some analysis on them uh, now. Um, well, let's think outside the logic box. There are many other NP-hard problems that we can use to express the problem of unsatisfiability. That's one of the nice things about the uh, completeness of SAT, or equivalently, the completeness of unsat. So, um, so proof complexity, a lot of the work uh, in, uh, over the last couple decades has been exploring a rich variety of techniques using expressions and theorems from algebra and from optimization. And we'll go through some of these uh, proof systems. And one of the nice consequences, in turn, the proof complexity results have actually fed back into our understanding of these other uh, NP-hard problems. So let's start with algebra. Well, in algebra, we can take these clauses, and this is where CNF is especially nice. We start with clauses, um, and we can convert them to polynomials. So this polynomial evaluates to 0 if and only if x1 is 0, so not x1, or x3 is 1. And uh, we can do similar things for the others, so that exact. Uh, and we add the, the constraints that every variable is equal to its square, which guarantees that things are either 0 or 1. Um, it turns out there's actually another translation that might be even nicer, which is to put two variables for every original variable, that they're 0 and 1, and um, one is the opposite of the other. So x prime is like the, uh, is kind of the analog of, x1 prime is the analog of not x1. And so we can just do a direct translation of the clauses. And if we multiply things out, the nice thing here is that we don't get big terms when we multiply them out. So, um, so how do we reason with these algebraic systems? Well, here goes our friend uh, David Hilbert. Uh, again, um, in the work before he got into uh, logic and proof, he proved his famous notion sats, of which this is a simplified special case. So we start of a sy with a system of polynomials, like the system that we generated from the clauses. That system has no solution, so it's unsatisfiable and in, the, in any extension field. If and only if, this, if there exist polynomials over the ground field, such when you take that linear combination, you get one, or one is in the ideal generated by these original polynomials, the abstract way you'd say it. But we actually want to write down and think about what these uh, polynomials are. And with this, you can get a one system, no Stalinsatz proof system over the, a field F. And so you get a different one over every field. The refutation is this sequence of polynomials G1 true Gn. Why is it a refutation? I should have mentioned this. Well, if all of these polynomials are 0, no matter what the GIs are, you get a left-hand side of 0 and a right-hand side of 1. Um, so uh, the other thing that's, that's nice is this xi squared minus xi is 0 ensures that any solution is 0, 1, so you don't need to go to any extension field. And it also ensures that we don't have to think about degrees in any variable larger than 1. So they're multilinear in the total degrees at most n. Um, 
So this is uh, one way one could uh, take uh, Hilbert's system and make a proof system of it, just write down the GIs uh, and check, just do the, the polynomial uh, mul multiply them out and check. Um, another system that's uh, more interesting is what's called polynomial calculus. It's a dynamic version of these notional ansatz refutations. These refutation lines are each a polynomial or a polynomial equation. So it's either an input polynomial equation or if you have two previous lines that are both zero, then you should know that their linear combination is zero for any two elements of the field. Or you can multiply by, um, by a, a variable um, uh, given a polynomial. Um, and the goal again is to derive that the polynomial one or that one is equal to zero and the size here, well, you gotta write down these polynomials somehow. So let's write down, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, we've got to write them uh, down these polynomials. So the total number of monomials or the degree, um, which is the maximum degree of any line. So, and Clegg Edmonds and Pagliazzo proved that there's actually a relationship between these two. If your refutation is uh, degree at most D, then actually can be found in this time. And of course the number of monomials has to be at most N to the D uh, just by simple counting. Uh, and the algorithms that do this are Grubner basis algorithm, which you can think of as iterated linear algebra, but the Grubner basis algorithm is a very useful algorithm that people apply in practice. And it turns out polynomial calculus exactly captures the capabilities of this Grubner basis algorithm. So, um, so this is another proof system where the proof system really uh, nicely matches what's going on in uh, practice. Um, well, for both of these systems, there are some, uh, well, first of all, polynomial calculus nicely simulates resolution. I thought I'd include one uh, simulation slide. I'll do it in the two variable form. So if we've got some uh, couple of clauses, we've got X and not X, and this is the thing they're supposed to infer. Here's a typical proof. So we do the translations with the two variables. We just multiply by the constant uh, terms. I've done a few steps. We add them up, we use the given, we add them up, and we get the final line. So uh, fairly straightforward, and this is uh, very typical of the kinds of simulations uh, one can get. Now, there are limits to polynomial calculus. In fact, Clegg Edmonds and Pagliazzo showed something just like we, uh, Ben uh, Sassan and Wigderson had a result for um, width of, of CNF formulas implying that if you've got one clause that's big, then the whole uh, proof must be big. In this case, it's if you've got one big degree term, then the whole proof is big. And in fact, Clegg Edmondson and Pagliazzo did this proof first, and Ben Sasson and Wigerson adapted it to the case of resolution. Unfortunately, both the pigeonhole principle and random KCNF formulas require exponential size refutations. Didn't help too much. But here is an interesting thing that's a bit different from before. The choice of field F can actually make a big difference. So if you're in characteristic P, you can efficiently prove properties that are exponential in some other characteristic Q. So we get a, a complex system of relationships among uh, different uh, uh, proof systems for different fields. Though for most of the rest of this, I'm gonna focus on the case of the field being the rationals or the reals. Let's go to another direction of thinking outside the logic box. So optimization. So we've got uh, our same CNF formula. Here we replace each literal by an expression. Negation is one, the uh, positive form is just the original variable. Negation is one minus it. And for every clause, we just say the sum has to be at least one. Um, we've got to add, of course, the fact that these variables are between zero and one, and our goal is to derive that negative one is bigger than or equal to zero. As formalized here, this isn't enough. This uh, is just linear programming, and it doesn't prove properties that are true just over zero, one. It it's the, proves properties over the whole interval of all values between zero and one. So the input formulation doesn't give us all the information we need. 
So there are two options and two directions of proof that people have used. One is cutting planes proofs, and the other is higher degree inequalities using this xi squared minus uh, x uh, squared minus x uh, system. Okay, so um, what are cutting planes proofs? Um, so these go back a ways to work of Gomery in 59, and Quattel actually formalized it as a proof system for integer programming. So lines have integer coefficients and integer right-hand sides, and we've got rules of addition, the usual rules that we have uh, for addition of inequalities, and multiplication by positive integers so it doesn't flip the sign. Um, these things don't actually take us beyond linear programming. The key thing we need is this division rule. We get to divide by a positive integer. So if we've got a common factor C, we can divide both sides by C and then round up. And this is only true because things are integers, and if we've got the, uh, the bounds b being between 0 and 1, it guarantees it's 0 and 1. So for example, if we know that 2x plus 2y plus 2z is at least 3, then we know x plus y plus z is at least two, so because we get three halves rounded up. Now, there's a lot of work where uh, people are trying to extend the kinds of things uh, they've used for SAT solvers to work for systems like a bit like cutting planes. So far as uh, Jakob Nordstrom and others have shown, uh, there are limitations. They haven't yet been able to get to the, the power of full cutting plane system. I'm not going to talk about the limits of the system specifically. I'm just going to go on to the other method. Oh, why is it called cutting planes first? So it's called cutting planes, so here's why. Basically, when you do that random linear combination, let's say if we take these two inequalities and we just add them, we get this inequality. So here's the region uh, that these inequalities give you. We get a new one that says everything is to the left of that line. Um, and what cutting planes allows you to do, the rounding essentially lets us shift that line to the first integer points that are going to be involved there, and we get to cut into the side of the polytope. So that's why it's cutting planes. Anyway, so we're going to work, go on now to higher degree uh, proof systems, um, the other method for ensuring 0, 1. And one of them, which I know a number of you will uh, have seen the Shirley Adams proof system, but probably not too many in the format I'm going to strive here. It's completely equivalent. So the general idea here, we're going to use that two-variable translation. So I'm going to stick that in just to make it more convenient to write down and fit on slides. So the refutation just is kind of like notional on sets, but more complicated. So we're going to have these equations, and they get to be multiplied by arbitrary polynomials. But these are supposed to be zero. So no matter what, these things are, are supposed to be zero. Fj is supposed to be positive, and we get to multiply it by this quantity. So this is a sum of products of these literals and their negations. Well, both of these are positive, and these things are non-negative. Both of these are bigger than or equal to zero, and this is bigger than or equal to zero. So if we've got these conditions, that tells us the left-hand side, well, this part is 0, and this part is bigger than or equal to 0. So we're saying negative 1, which is supposed to be equal to all of these things, is bigger than or equal to 0, an obvious contradiction. And again, like uh, uh, we can talk about the degree, how, how big a degree did you need to write it down, on how many monomials. And again, there's an end to the order D algorithm to actually uh, find these Shirley Adams proofs. So that's one method of doing it. Another method of doing it is to use the generalization or a generalization of Hilbert Schnellstellensatz to the positive Schnellensatz. So here I'm going to state a very restricted form. We've, we've started with linear inequalities and polynomial equations. So suppose we've got that. We can think of these as our original clauses and these are other constraints. And suppose those are satisfied over some compact set then that implies that some other polynomial is bigger than or equal to zero, and we could choose that polynomial to be the constant function minus one if we were going to refute things. If and only if there exist some polynomials um, p, and we're going to multiply 
each uh, of our original non-negative uh, 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 translation of our clauses by a sum of squares of polynomials, add another sum of squares, and then we get to do the same sorts of things that we were doing with uh, Nullstellensatz. And uh, this theorem generalizes the Nullstellensatz, but only over the reals. And if, for those of you who uh, know, it, here are some references. This is a particularly simple form of positive Stellensatz. There are a bunch of uh, varied versions. But this gives a proof system, and we don't need um, uh, variables in negation, where we just take that left-hand side and set it equal to minus 1. And this is the sum of squares proof system, which more or less was, equi under equivalent names, was independently invented uh, around 2000. Um, the, the names were used were positive Stellensatz, and other people called it Lasserre. I don't think he wa uh, was, was doing that. So um, anyway, sum of squares proofs on uh, many in the room know ha have been of huge interest in theoretical computer science uh, in uh, the last, uh, let's say, uh, decade or so. And there have been a big advances in our understanding of sum of squared uh, proofs. Um, and one of the things that's been important is the connection between optimization and refutation. So these proof systems can actually start with constraints that don't come from CNF formulas, so you can do things uh, directly. For optimization, low degree sum of squares uh, can derive all the constraints given by semi-definite programming algorithms. For example, the Gomans-Williamson algorithm for max cut can be captured by degree two sum of squares. On the other hand, if we've got degree lower bounds for, for sum of squares proofs, that implies lower bounds on many of our best optimization algorithms. So, I'm going to go through one example of a class of optimization algorithms that there's been a lot of recent work using proof complexity to understand. And this is extension complexity, which uh, was defined by Yanakakis. And the point there is many nat problems have natural expressions as optimization over some 0, 1 polytope, but with an exponential number of facets. And the input instance is given by the objective function. And I'm not going to go through a list of example problems, but the general idea of the extension approach is suppose you have some um, polytope that's given by some very large number of facets. You might be able to add extra variables, go to a higher dimension, and end up with fewer facets. Because each facet corresponds to a constraint, so it's a lot to write down. And then we know, so this one in particular has six versus eight, so it tells you you can get smaller, but there are cases where you get exponential speed up. And then you could use linear programming up on, on this upper polytope Q and then just project the answer down uh, to, to uh, P. And uh, a relatively, uh, so the LP extension complexity is the minimum number of facets of any extension. Um, and Kothari, Magka, and Aragavendra improving on uh, some work of uh, Chen Li, Raghavendra, Storer prove that the LP extension complexity of approximating any in a class of problems called constraint satisfaction problems is uh, at least n to the omega d, where d is the shirali adams degree required for the approximation. Uh, and as a consequence, for example, they prove that the LP extension complexity for max cut is only a half plus epsilon, or approximating max 3 sat is 7 eighths plus epsilon. You can do better, than, and we know we can do better than this with semi-definite programming. So what about semi-definite programming? Uh, there's a version uh, uh, of this that was defined in these two papers. And the basic approach is essentially the same. Start with the same original formulation, but lift to a semi-definite program rather than a linear program with extra variables and use the fact that we have polytime uh, semi-definite programming algorithm. Um, and the STP extension complexity is the minimum number of STP constraints of any extension. Well, uh, three years ago, Lee, Rang Lag Ragovendra, and Storer proved that for any uh, couple of results, first for any CSP, 
the STP extension complexity is polynomial if and only if the degree of uh, doing that, uh, uh, of solving that STP or approximating is also constant. Their, their theorem actually proved a little bit more, but I'm stating uh, weaker uh, uh, results for all of these than, than are in the original papers. And the other thing they showed is that the STP extension complexity of the famous traveling salesman problem or clique is two to the n to the epsilon for, uh, some, uh, for some epsilon. And very interestingly, their methods, their proof relies on a result of Gregoriev on something that seems completely unrelated but is related to sum of squares, which says if we have an inequality like this, and notice we've got this common factor two on the left-hand side, and we want to divide by a common factor two, here it's rounding down because it's less than or equal to, then you get at most n. And Gregoriev showed that the degree had to be linear. And that's the key uh, technical result that's behind these uh, stronger results of Lee, Raghavendra, and Storo. So um, these systems aren't the only uh, algebraic systems we could come up with. They're static systems like Nostell and Satz. Polynomial calculus was dynamic. Well, very interesting result from, from last year. In fact, that even though sum of squares is static and polynomial calculus is dynamic, sum of squares can efficiently simulate it over the reals. So that's a quite surprising result to me, a, a pretty interesting uh, result. So it says, well, okay, static polynomial calculus is pretty strong, but hey, why not make it dynamic? So we can have dynamic systems for inequalities. Say, given so two non-negative quantities, we can infer, can infer that their sum is non-negative or their product is non-negative. And we could add for, uh, the square of any polynomial. And again, the goal would be to infer uh, minus one is bigger than equal to zero. Um, we actually know very little in terms of lower bounds for this, system, uh, this class of systems. In terms of proof size, we know uh, somewhat more restricted things uh, for, for special uh, properties. And as far as I know, the best result we know is something like the following which says that if we restrict this dynamic system to just like that DPLL to one that can't reuse derived formulas, then a certain class of formulas do require exponential size if the degree isn't, uh, isn't very big, if it's, it's bounded below, uh, below log n. Um, so that's it for the, the general proof systems. Here is kind of a graph of of many, I think, uh, of the known relationships amongst these proof systems. Here, this sum of squares Lasserre is above all of these, and we actually know a fair number of lower bounds for it. We have these other uh, relations. This is that one of those dynamic uh, systems, and they could all be simulated by Frege. And what about our friend's uh, pigeonhole? Uh, well, we actually precisely know the, the boundary between our, um, the, uh, the pigeons. Actually, maybe the pigeons should be happy down here because they can't tell that there's, uh, the systems can't tell. But anyway, it's exponentially hard in this lower part and very easy up there. Um, for random formulas, we know a little bit uh, less. Um, for, it turns out this random formulas for the sum of squares or Lasserre system actually even holds, is even hard if we have random three XORs. And that turns out, again, to have surprising consequences. You can prove that lots of NP hard problems uh, require a uh, large sum of squares proofs based on just the, on reductions from this uh, random three XOR problem. And pl cutting planes, it's a little bit, uh, uh, it's not quite as, uh, you know, we can't prove it for three. What's interesting about random formulas, they're not known to be easy for any proof system. So uh, maybe they're hard for TC0, Frege, ZFC? We don't know. Um, so, uh, so that's one challenge. Uh, um, so in general, uh, proof complexity captures many of our best uh, uh, approaches towards solving hard problems. It covers practical approaches for formal methods and verifications. 
methods such as a linear programming, semi-definite programming for optimization, and you know, come join the, the working on uh, this field of study. It's pretty interesting, I think. So thank you. Well, you, the pigeons you saw were pretty fat. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank